Good evening, everybody. I'm Jennifer Steinhauer, director of the Speaker Series here at the Institute of Politics. We're pleased to welcome you to join a discussion tonight about the state officials' latest efforts to address climate change in Illinois, and uh, welcome to our online audience as well. Before one of our students formally introduces our guests in a minute, I would like to mention a couple of upcoming events we have at the IOP and go over a few housekeeping notes. Tomorrow, Tuesday, IOP Executive Director Zenat Rahman will be moderating a virtual event at 12.30 to discuss the racial wealth gap, featuring Helene Gale from the Chicago Community Trust, Dana Peterson of the Conference Board, and Laura Arce of uh, Unidos U.S. On Wednesday, April 20, at the Institute of Politics, the Program on the Global Environment and the Energy Policy Institute are hosting an evening conversation at the Illinois with IOP Fellow and former Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, and former IOP fellow Heather mctier Tony about cities, climate change, and communities of color. And on Friday, April 22nd, the Institute of Politics and UC Chicago Global are hosting a midday conversation at the Rubenstein Forum about democracy and economic development with four former presidents from Latin America. After tonight's moderated discussion, we will open the floor to take questions from you in the audience. Please line up and ask your question at the microphone. Masks are optional for students when asking questions per the university's latest guidelines. And as usual, we give priority for the first questions to be asked by our students. So please uh, make sure your phones are on silent. And we will now hear our formal introductions of our speakers from Noelle Diaz, a master's student with the Committee on International Relations, specializing in state security, human rights, and international law. Graduating this year, Noelle is a speaker series ambassador. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Good evening, and thank you everyone who is joining us in person and online for this event, and welcome to the Institute of Politics latest speaker series event. I'm pleased to be introducing our panelist lineup regarding climate change in Illinois. First, we have Pat Devaney, the Secretary Treasurer of the Illinois AFL-CIO, whose work surrounding climate change has emphasized the need for legislation that can provide for effective climate policies that also include workers' rights, especially when it comes to creating good jobs and appropriate wages. Our second panelist is Delmar Gillis, the CEO and COO of Elevate Energy. His work there has helped bring clean energy projects about, as well as supporting initiatives that engage in job creation, focusing on communities that are underserved with an emphasis on environmental justice. Our third panelist is Christian Mitchell, the Deputy Governor of Illinois, focusing on public safety, infrastructure, energy, and environment. A public policy undergrad at the University of Chicago, Christian has had many roles in the political sphere as a state representative and political consultant. When it comes to the environment, he has focused on Illinois having a clean energy economy, which he supported by being a co-sponsor of the Illinois Clean Jobs Bill when he was a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. Our final panelist of the evening is State Senator Sue Rezin, a Republican from Morris, Illinois, who has served in the Senate since 2010. Senator Rezin is currently a member of various committees, which include the Senate Executive Health and Insurance Committees, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, and is also the Minority Spokesperson on the Senate Energy and Public Utilities, Education, and Human Rights Committees. She was one of the two Senate Republicans to vote for the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. All four of the panelists played a key role in the negotiation and formation of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, which was signed into law by Governor J.B. Pritzker in September 2021. Tonight's event is being moderated by WBEZ reporter Michael Puente. Much of his work is on the southeast side, the south suburbs of Chicago, and northwest Indiana. Over the years, Michael has earned dozens of awards for his reporting. He has also served as an adjunct professor at the Calumet College of St. Joseph in Hammond, Indiana, where he has taught journalism and speech. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Well, thank you, everybody, and it's uh, great to be here, and I'd like to thank the University of Chicago Institute of Politics for the invitation. So we'll just get started, and we'll start with the uh, first question with Dup uh, Deputy Governor of Illinois, Mi um, Christian Mitchell. Christian, tell us a little bit about the legislation that passed last year. Why did the governor feel it was needed? First of all, what's in it, and why was it needed? Uh, well, I'll try to give an overview, and I'll apologize in advance. Uh, I'm a little stuffy, so if I sound like Snuffleupagus, that's why. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a couple things. I mean, first of all, the governor said while he was campaigning um, that he wanted to make sure that Illinois was a leader on climate. 
And so the first thing that he emphasized when he was talking to me about taking point on this bill was this needs to be a climate bill, and it needs to be a climate bill that takes into account the ways in which environmental justice communities, overwhelmingly black and brown, places like the southeast side of Chicago, um, have borne the brunt of pollution in order to make sure that we had economic vitality. So if we're going to shift more toward a green economy, if we are going to try to get this right, let's make sure we lead with those who have been left behind. I believe the Climate Equitable Jobs Act did that um, because he wanted to do those things, but also make sure, and this is something I'm sure Pat will talk about more, how do we make sure that the clean energy revolution doesn't leave working people behind, gets a whole new generation of people into good paying union jobs? So what's in the bill is a series of things. Uh, we led with ethics reform. I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point this evening. Our largest utility was ensnared in a corruption scandal. We wanted to make sure that we ended formula rate making, which uh, allowed them to basically collect profit without as much oversight as they should have had. So we shifted more toward incentivizing our utilities to invest in things like reliability, affordability, equity, making sure the grid was prepared to get more electric vehicles and chargers onto the grid. Um, so we changed the way we did rate making to create more transparency and to end things like consumer deposit fees for low income customers. So we, we also made sure that affordability was prioritized. We doubled our commitment to renewable energy to more than $500 million a year through our renewable portfolio standards so that we'll be at 40% uh, renewable energy by 2030 and 50% by 2040. Uh, we supported our nuclear fleet, the nation's largest, at the lowest possible cost to the ratepayer, about 255 a megawatt hour, as opposed to the $16 that was paid in 2016. Uh, which is, is phenomenal for our energy grid because it was 52% of our power and more than two-thirds of all of our clean energy. And that fleet has now renewed its leases and will be here for years and hopefully decades uh, to come. Uh, we also, and this is very, very key, and I'm sure Delmar will talk about this a little bit later, we made sure that we also invested in equity so that 10% of the uh, solar for all money that's being spent is gonna be spent with equity eligible contractors in environmental justice communities who will have access to wealth creation opportunities. And we made sure throughout the bill that, the, that there is prevailing wage on the work uh, and that for utility scale projects, for example, there are project labor agreements. Again, I'm sure Pat will talk about this more. We touched energy efficiency. We invested in an electric vehicle uh, credit that's going to provide $4,000 to consumers purchasing electric vehicles, prioritizing low-income customers first, and reimbursing 80% of the cost of charging stations. And in our latest budget, we actually added $10 million to make those $4,000 rebates go a little bit further. We also touched energy efficiency, and I'm sure there's a few more things that I'm forgetting. So um, the last thing I'll say, and this was one of the more controversial aspects, was decarbonization. So we are going to phase out private uh, coal and gas by, or sorry, private coal by 2030. We're phasing out all coal and gas, including municipal plants like Prairie State and Dalman by 2045. Uh, we are ramping those down slowly over time while allowing new gas build, which is a bit controversial, but um, was something that we thought was important to preserve reliability and created the ability for our RTOs to say, hey, this individual plan is already at its cap, but we need it for reliability, or it's set to go offline, we need it for reliability. Not politicians, but professional regulators will say, hey, that's gonna stay online for a little bit longer. So we think we did this in a responsible, equitable, affordable way. I think that's a pretty decent overview. I'm sure yeah, we'll absolutely, say absolutely. So. But I, 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 I wanna stay with you for one second, because we do know how climate change has affected the entire uh, world, and here, here in, near the United States, we had more tornadoes and hurricanes. But how does the governor's office see climate change impacting, say, the Chicago area? How does it? How do we see it here? Well, I'd say a couple things about this, and again, I'm sure others will have thoughts. So, I'm actually let me start not in Chicago, and I'll zoom in in Chicago okay. and answer your question. So. My first year, I remember uh, the governor and I and some other folks went with our National Guard and the Emergency Management Agency downstate because there was record flooding. We are seeing 100-year floods every other year, um, devastating our farmers, devastating our economy. And so we saw that firsthand just on the ground with levees that were breached and entire towns that were underground, places like Cairo, Illinois, one of the poorest uh, and, and most diverse communities in the state of Illinois, deeply affected by flooding and not for the first time. So that was one big area. I think the other thing that we see is we see shoreline erosion here at, at Lake Michigan. I used to represent um, this area and the lakefront. 
um, over by the point and other places you see shoreline erosion. Uh, you also see significant, and this isn't quite climate change, but it's, it's impacted, obviously, significant levels of pollution, significant levels of asthma, especially in black and brown communities that are over-industrialized. And so if we could bring down those levels, if we could start to you know, do our part to lower the temperature of the earth or keep it from rising further, to prevent that flooding, to prevent that pollution going in the lungs of our kids, that was kind of the way that I think we saw it in Illinois. Now, State Senator Sue Rezin, um, you're one of two Republicans who voted for the bill. Uh, before we get into why you voted for it, tell us a little bit about your district. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm from Morris, Illinois. Does anyone know where Morris is? <laughs> I uh, do know that WBZ So, for the record, some people there. raise their hands. Um, <laughs> I represent a district that um, has a lot of energy producers. So, I have of the six nuclear power plants, I represent three of the nuclear power plants in my district along with there's wind and solar farms, battery farms. There's also the coal plants and the peaker plants that Christian, uh, that uh, Deputy Governor Mitchell also spoke about. Uh, because of all of the energy producing companies in my district, we have the major grid system that cuts right through my district and helps to, and we have a 765 kV line that moves power to the East Coast. Tremendously valuable assets when you're talking about economic um, development and also energy in the area. So that's the district that I represent. I, um, I, when we started negotiating the bill, as Michael said, I knew that first, first and foremost, in order to decarbonize and, and reduce our carbon footprint, you need to have nuclear, especially since Illinois is home to the largest nuclear fleet in the country with the six nuclear power plants. 54% of our energy portfolio comes from nuclear, which is a zero carbon emitter. Um, so in order to be able to get to the goals that we set in the bill that uh, Christian talked about, it was important to keep our nuclear power plants online. As you know, the nuclear power plants are struggled, not only in the state of Illinois, but they're struggled. They're stranded assets th throughout the entire country because they're not valued yet in, at the federal level. We were hoping that that would happen. That has not happened. Because of that, the state of Illinois has had to go ahead until the federal government decides to uh, take up this issue. The state of Illinois, we passed our own bill that recognizes nuclear as renewable energy and a zero carbon emitter. Um, it was, uh, why, am I one, why was I one of two Republicans yeah, to support right. the bill? Well, first of all, I represent everything in the bill uh, is in my backyard. Uh, just from the job perspective, just to put in perspective, every nuclear power plant has about 900 permanent jobs. They're good paying jobs, they're six figure jobs, right? And of uh, all of the extra jobs on top of it at each nuclear power plant, and Pat could talk to this, there's probably an additional 1,500 jobs when you have a nuclear outage, which happens once a year for every nuclear power plant. Tremendous job producer, tremendous economic producer in our area. So that's incredibly important. But as we're trying to decarbonize, though, it's incredibly important that we keep the nuclear power plants online. And um, as a result of it, uh, we have been able to, through some very strong negotiations uh, with this bill that we did pass. It's important in my district. I want to make sure everybody in my district works at these plants and they know somebody that works at these plants. It was very personal for me. Uh, oftentimes when we negotiated this bill, as everyone can attest to up here, probably the most intense negotiations in the 12 years I've been in the Senate for a topic I've ever seen. And we thought that the bill was dead. I did a couple of times. I was preparing to go back to tell my district, it's just not going to happen because there's too many moving pieces and they weren't coming together in a timely manner. So it was very difficult. But because of the leaders that you see on this, on this stage, um, we came together and was able to move it across the finish line and the governor was able to sign it. Just staying with you just for a moment, though, well, what do you say to people who are reluctant to, to support the legislation? It's already passed, of course, but what, what would be your best arguments to say why this is needed? What, well, first of all, it's important. If, you're, if your goal for the state of Illinois is to decarbonize and you take nuclear out of the equation, the cost goes up tremendously. So there is a cost to this bill, but since we were able to save the nuclear fleet, the cost is much, much less than it normally would have been. So that's the first uh, topic I would uh, talk to them about is the cost impact. When we talk about energy policy and you're putting together your energy portfolio, there are four pillars that are incredibly important. Reliability, meaning when you turn the, 
uh, light switch on, is the power going to come on, right? Uh, if, if a storm goes through or if it's 110 degrees, will you have power available? Resiliency is incredibly important where we've seen in other states such as Texas uh, when they had their polar, polar vortex, uh, California, and we had our polar vortex in 2014. You didn't know that we had a polar vortex because the nuclear fleets are just churning and burning 24 hours, seven days a week. But in other states, they had interruptions. So resiliency uh, because of weather is incredibly important. Uh, green, clean power, that's what we're trying to do in this bill, is to bring down our carbon footprint and get to zero uh, carbon emissions by the year 2050. But cost effective, cost effective, what does it mean to the rate payer? Because ultimately the person who receives their bill does not want to pay more for what we're talking about, right? Or they want to pay, they're happy to pay a little bit more, but we have to be very conscious of how we're handling this because even though we want zero emissions, we can't increase the cost of power on high energy users and rate payers at a cost that they can't afford. So we're balancing all four of those pillars when we were negotiating this bill. And I say to my colleagues, especially my colleagues, many of my colleagues are in Southern Illinois, mm -hmm. and Pat can attest to this. I mean, in this bill, there's a major um, premature closure of the coal plants, which we're arguing is not good for the environment, right? Um, it's not good, uh, it, but it is the cheapest cost of energy. But many of my colleagues, that I work with represent Southern Illinois, and to them, those are jobs. So when we're saying that in this bill, your plants will be closing, your neighbors will be losing their job, they have concerns. So again, we're trying to balance all of these different issues when we're negotiating a bill, because this hits home. It's not, we're not sitting in a room in Chicago saying, hey, this is best for the state of Illinois. Every decision we make has an impact to our neighbors that live in our districts, and Pat can talk about that too. Before we get into the, the jobs aspect, let me bring in first a uh, little bit of Delmar Gillis to talk about, first of all, tell us a little bit, you're the CEO of Elevate Energy, tell us a little bit about that company. Yes, and thank you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Elevate. Elevate is a, a company or an organization that's based here in Chicago, and we're really focused on ensuring underserved communities have access to clean air, clean water, and clean energy. And as you've listened to the conversation that we've been having, um, that access is important. Um, if you think about what we're doing to our planet, if you think about the environment, it is important that we not leave certain communities behind. Uh, and one of the things that we really worked hard on as part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition was to ensure that especially black and brown communities were included in the benefits of the bill. Um, so whether that is the jobs that were created for contractors working on solar installation, or it was making sure that uh, the incentive dollars that were provided for uh, a variety of different programs were equally allocated, one of the things that I specifically focused on was making sure that there was equity and that's a major focus of Elevate and the work that we do here in Illinois. And how do you, how do you see Elevate, Illinois, uh, Elevate, Elevate Energy playing a role in the renewable energy sector moving forward? Well, I think it, it's often from the perspective of being the voice of those that often don't have a seat at the table. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to focus on as I was helping with this bill and working with the great panelists here was to make sure when we look back five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, we all could hold our heads up and say that this bill was equitable, that we created jobs in communities that historically have been left behind. And I feel like through um, my role at Elevate and through partnerships uh, with folks like Pat Devaney, we have an opportunity to not just ensure that there's equity, but really create new opportunities and communities that have been historically left behind uh, as it relates to solar, EV, uh, battery technology, et cetera. And that was, to me, really exciting. Okay, now let's get to Pat Devaney since everyone's been pointing at him, just waiting for him to start talking. <laughs> Pat is the Secretary Treasurer of the Illinois <laughs> FLCIO. So everybody wants to know, of course, 
you know, with the future and clean energy, what does it mean for my job? What does it mean for how I do my business? Am I going to lose my job in a coal plant or wherever? What, why, how, how do you explain it to people who may be fearful of the future? Yeah, it's a great question because this whole process in terms of organized labor and the, and the people that I represented really started with a conversation that's difficult to have amongst organized labor. We're going to be changing state policy that is going to be transitioning from fossil generation to renewable generation. And then also we're very concerned, as Senator Rezin pointed out, about our robust nuclear fleet and the thousands of great paying jobs that it provides. So we sat in a room, we formed a, a coalition called Climate Jobs Illinois to really focus on this issue and to take it on head on. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we really had to do is around the table, we had to say, yeah, climate change is a thing. It hurts us personally our, for future generations. It's going to hurt us economically in the work that we do in the future. So we have to be proactive as we go out and work on energy policy and understand that we're gonna have to take steps that are going to be painful but it's the right thing to do, but also best for our jobs for the future. So one of the things that we did see in the past, uh, the Future Energy Jobs Act called FEJA that they passed in 2016, it provided millions of dollars for renewable energy development, wind and solar. However, because there was a previous gubernatorial administration at that time, um, that thought differently about organized labor and helping working people than Governor Pritzker does, there were no labor standards attached to any of that renewable energy development in the state. The bill has $600 million that they're going to spend annually on building out wind and solar to help us reach our clean energy uh, goals. In the bill, unlike FIJA in 2016, we were able to secure some of the most robust labor standards, the most robust labor standards of any state in the country. It puts prevailing wage on all wind and solar development with the exception of rooftop residential. And it also provides project labor agreements, agreements as to how the work is going to be done and the jurisdiction of the workers, often almost always with union companies and union workers on all utility scale projects, the large uh, solar farms and the wind farms across the state which is half of the money that's allocated for the REC. So the labor standards that we were able to secure in the bill, preserving our nuclear fleet, was a trade-off, again, to be able to make those decisions on decarbonization and closing you know, coal generation and then eventually the, the dirtiest gas. But with still the opportunity, as Deputy Governor Mitchell said, to do gas development, uh, combined cycle, the com cleanest type of gas uh, development that could be transitioned into hydrogen in the future. There are three projects right now. One's currently underway, two are in the queue that's gonna provide thousands of construction jobs over the next several years. So we're all so excited about that. Well, I was gonna ask you, what are some of the emerging um, jobs or industries that are related to the future with climate change or renewable energy that you see developing over, say, the next 10 to 20 years, Pat? A lot of what you we're going to see are jobs in renewable development, building both solar as well as wind with the huge dollars that we have allocated to build out in those industries. But you also have, you know, around electric vehicle manufacturing, the governor's office passed a bill last fall that creates incentives for people to not only locate uh, vehicle manufacturing, but also the rest of those supply chain businesses around EV manufacturing to reach the goals of the state in terms of how many EVs we have on the road in the future and to decarbonize our transportation sector. There's the charging infrastructure that's going to be invested in, that jobs are going to be in building out charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. And again, there was a huge preservation of literally thousands of good paying jobs in our nuclear fleet when we were finally able to reward four of the six facilities for their clean energy generation attributes, which was also contained in the bill. So lots of opportunities, both in terms of keeping good jobs, but also transitioning in a way that's responsible in, in the future, that workers are going to be paid to where they can enter the middle class or ascend within it, instead of these jobs going to those low road employers, oftentimes coming from out of state, like we mm -hmm. saw after Fiji was passed. Can I just sure. add one thing Absolutely. to this? So I, one thing that I really just want to thank all the panelists for, because one thing that made this, I think, so much better of a process than Fiji, and I think Pat alluded to some of this, is like everyone from every interest group came to the table 
not just to say, here's what I want. I want this to be equitable. I want it to be a just transition. But like, here's how to do it, right? So I think about some of, of Sue's colleagues downstate, and I think about the coal to solar program. They're able to get into the bill. Um, several hundred million dollars to basically say we've got all of this interconnection that already exists on these coal plants, many of which announced they were closing even before this bill passed. And we're going to take all that and we're going to use it to build solar panels and storage right on that site that's going to preserve some of that property tax base in a way that's going to help downstate mm -hmm. communities, for example. I look at some of the just transition stuff that we talked about that's mm -hmm. going to provide, again, some of that property tax replacement training. Um, the, the workforce hubs that are specifically targeted toward pre-apprenticeships that, that uh, Pat and his team advocated for. I think about some of the equity provisions on the equitable workforce as well as equity eligible contractors and thinking about how rooftop solar could be this haven for um, you know, folks who are just breaking into the business. Everyone came to the table, yes, had difficult conversations, but also was able to say, here's what I want, here's how it makes a difference, here's how it's going to put union men and women to work, here's how it's going to help downstate workers, here's how it's going to help black and brown contractors. And so now you've got sort of a brotherhood and a sisterhood of ideas all coming to the table saying, here's the actual policy we want to see, not just the principle. And I think that made this a much better process. See, Senator uh, Resin, you mentioned a um, uh, little bit of discussion about some of maybe folks more downstate. Illinois may have a, a little bit bigger climb to so, sort of a, a buy-in into the future of this. How, what, are, what are some of the arguments that you make to sort of um, help push the argument further that this is uh, something we need to do? Well, it's difficult, obviously, because they're seeing the energy producers, mainly the coal plants downstate, closing. Um, and uh, they attribute it to the bill, but I'll be honest with you, many private companies are making that decision to close if they have coal plants. They're making that decision to close them. But downstate, when you are a politician and you're representing these plants that are closing and jobs will be gone, it becomes a dynamic you need to deal with. So when you're having town halls, and I had actually one of the coal plants was in my district, and when you have a town hall, you know, the people making the policy or the decisions may be here in Chicago, but I'll go to Hennepin and you'll have a town hall with two, 300 people wanting to know what's the next step. In their mind, you know, the next step for them, and that's before this bill passed, was I'm going to have to go work in a distribution center for $15 or $20 an hour. Now with this bill though, it's, I think it's much better thought out in terms of as we're transitioning from coal to the next step, and as Christian said, on several of the sites in southern Illinois, we're moving from coal to solar. So there'll be solar plants on the coal, uh, on the plant property, so we can maintain a, a partial or the property tax base and also some of the jobs to build it out. That's a good thing. Um, what's difficult, and we are still having those challenges. I must not have gone, done a good job because nobody, in, uh, my colleagues in Southern Illinois didn't support the bill, but they're just coming from the perspective of their coal plants are closing. Um, we need to also look at the RTO in Southern Illinois has a problem, it's called MISO, and it, we're concerned about a reliability problem. So many of my colleagues were also concerned that if the plants were closing, are we going to have a reliability problem more so than we're in the PJM RTO, uh, Northern Illinois, more so than the PJM? Those are very good um, discussions and conversations and questions that they asked. And uh, lastly, they were concerned about seeing the just you know the cost of the ratepayers go up. It's very it's a very difficult conversation to sit down with many people to say, let me walk you through how this is better. If we have no bill at all, your cost will go up anyway because we have just um, adopted a goal to reduce our carbon to zero carbon emission in the year 2050. So by doing that, it will be more costly if you don't have the nuclear power plants. It's a very difficult um, conversation to have with them and also to explain to many of their constituents down south. Um, but you know, I, I do believe that once they see the coal to solar go on properties in Southern Illinois, and they will see that it is you know, good for them and we'll continue to work on that. And along with Pat and, and Delmar, make sure that we have the good paying labor jobs to build this out. I have all of this industry in my backyard. I want skilled labor working in this industry in my backyard, okay? And so um, I would say that we've become, in the past, I don't know if we've really worked together until we had 
the opportunity on this bill to, to you know, explain and work together from a labor perspective and my perspective, and it's, it's been a great relationship, but it's incredibly important that we have skilled labor building out all of these projects. And one last thing I'd like to say back to what um, Deputy Governor said as well, um, I have one of the combined cycle natural gas plants being built in my district as well. It's about a billion dollar investment, 500 jobs to build it out. That plant, because of this bill, well, it, um, has the ability to convert to hydrogen. And there is, uh, this bill will allow for that and will allow under certain circumstances these plants to stay online. And that's because of the conversations we've had together. Well, Del Margulis, um, Senator Resin talked about the reluctance of some residents in Southern Illinois mm -hmm. with this bill, but uh, even in the urban corridor here, there may be populations that feel that maybe that's something that's almost unattainable for them as well. How do you get a buy-in into black and brown communities that the future of renewable energy, the jobs that Pat was talking about, that they're accessible to them as well. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to one word, which really was listen. Um, oftentimes when we work on programs like this, the folks that are at the community level do not feel heard. And one of the things that we really focused on was listening and understanding the issues. And what we tried to do uh, to what uh, Deputy Governor Min Mitchell mentioned was we took the ideas directly from the community and brought those to the negotiating table. Um, for instance, black contractors came to me and said uh, that they don't feel like they have enough working capital to participate in these projects. They're too capital intensive. Well, we got funding in there to fund upfront capital needs. Um, there were other folks that said, hey, these jobs sound exciting, but uh, I'm formally incarcerated. Can I get access to these opportunities? So we made sure that we built in opportunities and training for folks that were formerly incarcerated. Um, there were people that were concerned about childcare, tools, equipment, um, having uh, transportation to and from work. We built all of those things in. So when you look at the workforce solutions, it's not just about going to a local training center and getting trained. It's addressing the needs and the, the priorities of underserved communities and then providing them with the resources that they need to uh, contribute at a level that they're comfortable with. Um, and then lastly, I would say, uh, Pat mentioned uh, uh, FIJA, the previous bill. One of the things that we did do in FIJA was actually pilot many of the training programs that focused on underserved communities and members of underserved communities. And for the first few courses that were offered that were 12 week programs, um, we saw that uh, almost 100% completed the courses, even with the complicated math that was included. Mm -hmm. And of those, roughly 80% were able to get placed. And so we know that the training programs work, we know that the placement work, and we also know that forming partnerships with community colleges is a way to further expand the reach of the training. So we're actually very excited that these programs are gonna work for those that historically uh, have not felt included in a bill like this. Well, Pat, you, you were talking about some of the jobs and everything. Uh, what specifically, are these opportunities that you hear, reluctance, whether it be downstate Illinois or up here in the urban corridor of Chicago, are there opportunities for the AFL-CIO to either implement new programs, training strategies, to make sure folks who feel that they're left behind aren't being left behind? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this process, being newer to the state Fed and certainly mm -hmm. didn't come from an energy background, was really beneficial to me to really hear from Delmar, hear from people in the black and brown communities about barriers that they had had to entering the building and construction trades or, or getting a, a union job. And so as we discussed that and worked through those issues, I think I learned a great deal about things that our organization needs to do better um, and improve upon to make sure that we are uh, creating a diverse workforce to not only work in renewable energy development, but in building and construction in general. One of the things that we were able to secure, and there are two different tracks, and Delmar was a really powerful voice uh, in the room, and, and got some workforce development um, dollars to build out training centers and workforce development hubs across the state. We were also able to 
secure $10 million annually to create through what we call three climate jobs, Illinois workforce development hubs, to partner with community organizations, existing pre-apprenticeship programs where they might uh, recruit and, and prepare people to enter an apprenticeship program in the building and construction trades. We recently just hired our first ever equity director uh, for the coalition as well as the state fed to help us implement these pieces and again partner with community colleges, existing community organizations uh, and, and others to make sure that we are um, recruiting, identifying and preparing uh, a black and brown workers to enter the building and construction trade. So I do think that the impact of having these conversations along the way helped us, me as an individual, but certainly us as an organization as well. Well, Deputy Governor Mitchell, you may have mentioned it earlier, but what specifically is the state doing to help educate uh, communities, both Southern Illinois and, and here in the urban corridor of Chicago, that there are opportunities there within this bill to access those jobs in the future? Yeah, I mean, the the it's, kind of hard to follow these guys on this because <laughs> the hubs really are the way, right? So we're going to have, I think it's 13 hubs around the state that are, are clean uh, workforce hubs. There's the, the additional hubs focused specifically on pre-apprenticeships. So we want to push people toward those. We want to make sure that our Department of Commerce, the Economic Opportunity, is partnering with the folks on this stage as well as others to make sure that they get the, the word out. I think, though, another thing, and Delmar mentioned this, is what I often heard. So I started as a community organizer right out of school, and then I was a state rep for six years here, mm. and now I'm in the governor's office, was, you know, we're tired of training programs. We've got all the training programs in the universe, and you're training me for a job that doesn't exist. So what we need to do is, is to find those folks who have gone all the way through and actually gotten connected to the job, number one, and showcase those folks, those men and women, black and brown, hopefully. Um, but then also to say, for some of those equity-eligible contractors, I own my own business, and I am doing business now with the state of Illinois, and I am feeding my family, and I'm able to give back to my community, and I'm able to hire some of these graduates because of the opportunity that I now have. And so I think that our focus is going to be standing up these programs, running them efficiently, keeping partners engaged through the process, but then also saying here is not just the job opportunity, but the wealth creation opportunity, the ability to, to be an entrepreneur in this space that we know is going to see its market cap grow every single year in not in perpetuity but certainly for decades and the state of illinois helped make this possible so that's that's the goal now that what i always say is good policy dies for lack of good implementation so that's what we're really <laughs> focused on with the implementation meeting that i have twice a week so and could i sure, piggyback sure, off of, of what deputy governor mitchell said one of the key aspects and he had mentioned it earlier was around accountability and so one of the frustrations that I had with uh, the previous legislation was that businesses could access state funding and meet no equity or diversity requirements. And so one of the things that we built into the bill is when you apply to get renewable energy credits, you have to talk about the equity and diversity of your project team, of your program in order to access the funding. We're also going to be capturing demographic data on the projects as well. And so if a business continually has a history of not uh, meeting diversity targets, then they will be at risk of not receiving future funding. And it was really important to us that there was an accountability measure and that there was accurate reporting around this because we didn't want to get to a place 10, 15 years down the road where once again, we have underserved communities not having access to the hundreds of millions of dollars that were gonna be invested in the clean energy economy in our state. So we're very excited about having these accountability measures built in. Well, how do you, how do you of the accountability measures, how do you keep track of those? Say not just six months from now, a year, five years, 10 years from now that they are working the way they're supposed to. Yeah, well, the, the way that it's structured is whenever you, uh, let's say that there's a project to install solar here at uh, University of Chicago, um, a project needs to be submitted to the Illinois Power Agency. And that project, when it gets submitted, you have to put in there what your plan is uh, to implement the solar. There's some technical pieces with tying in the ComEd's electrical grid, um, there's project information about who are your contractors, who are your subcontractors, who are your primes, et cetera. So all of this data is going to be collected and captured um, for every project. So we're going to have pretty accurate records on 
uh, who's participating in this work uh, moving forward. And the one thing I'll just add to that sure. is, is um, and much of it, and my agencies were screaming at me about the headaches they're going to have, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be put into public reports that are going to go to the General Assembly and stakeholders. Yeah. Um, and so folks will be able to ask questions, right? And we, we concluded accountability, yes, for our large utilities, but also, and this was a really strong push from Senator Resin, for all of our renewable energy companies are going to have to do some of the same reporting measures. They're going to have to come before, and I've had this experience, it's not fun, before Sue's committee when she's got all of her notes out and is grilling them <laughs> on each individual line of what they've done. That, that may be sort of um, like inefficient, but I think it's a really important accountability measure, and, and our goal was basically because we really do believe sunlight's the best disinfectant. How do you get as much of this into the public domain as possible so that mm -hmm. public policymakers going forward, community organizations, news organizations can make good decisions about what worked and what didn't? Because we took a bunch of the lessons we learned from Fiji about what didn't work, to Delmar's point, and about how we don't overpay relative to the subsidization we need to do of, of clean and, and zero emission technology, and we paid that forward to make CJA a better bill. That we think is a good model going forward. Yeah. Senator Resin, I, I, you must do some traveling. Uh, have you have you seen where there are um, programs or initiatives implemented in other states that you would like to see that implemented here in Illinois? Well, I, I was going to add that I sit on the NCSL National Conference for State Legislators, so I sit on their Energy Committee, I sit on their Executive Committee, and it's you know it's just a kind of all of the energy uh, think tanks, um, s state legislators from across the country come together, bipartisan, to work on problems. Obviously, I feel that uh, this collaboration and this bill that was passed in the state of Illinois is probably at the forefront of what other states are trying to do. They're looking at the state of Illinois as the model for what they need to do. Now, if you look at everyone's portfolio that they have for energy, every state's different. We happen to have six nuclear power plants. Most other states do not. Their energy portfolio is made up of many different types of energy. Their energy policy or um, goals may be very reflective of what we're trying to do is to decarbonize and get to zero emissions by the year 2050. And we're hearing that from the federal government and many other states as well. So there will be bits and pieces of the bill that we passed, actually, that I feel other states will be looking at, especially um, what Delmar and, and Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell talked about regarding, you know, the social justice equity component. We didn't do it, as Christian said, we didn't do it the best in 2016 when we passed FIJA, but we learned from it. And I feel that what we have in this bill is uh, more reflective, more accountable, more data-driven. Mm -hmm to make sure that we actually are creating jobs and we are allowing small businesses uh, in the black and brown communities to have access to capital so they can grow their companies. I think other states are looking at what we've done and I think we'll be a good, um, good um, for everybody else. Well, speaking of other states, does El the state of Illinois, do you, either as a state senator or deputy governor, do you worry about your neighboring states and what they're doing to combat climate change or not doing, uh, or do you just worry about Illinois and let that be used as an example? I mean, we live right next to Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa. Do their efforts in those states, does it matter to you, or do you worry just about the state of Illinois? You want to take first crack? Or? Sure. Well, to answer your question, yes, it doesn't matter what your other states are doing. We're in RTOs, um, so I talked about the MISO RTO, which is a collaboration of numerous states uh, that can buy power together. Same with the PJM. So it does matter what your state next to you is doing, just for the fact that if they're not um, reducing their carbon footprint, does it affect you? Probably so. We want to make sure, and also from a competitive nature, from a business nature. So if you talk to businesses, high energy users, which I also represent in my district as well, say, you know, um, that the uh, next to their payroll, the energy line item is their highest cost. They're looking at the cost of energy. So if you are trying to do the right thing in your state by passing this bill and reducing your carbon, it's costing a little bit more to that high energy user, a couple upticks and, you know, if, if their goal isn't to um, you know, make sure they're reducing the carbon and they're just carbon, they're looking for the cheapest cost, then you become competitive with the state across the line or close to you that still has their energy portfolio that's comprised of maybe coal or a lot of natural gas, which is 
less costly, but a bigger footprint. So you are competing. We're, you know, that's why this has been very difficult. We've uh, worked for probably two years on this bill, and I would say hundreds, at least hundreds of working groups and meetings to get to where we are. And it took so long because it is messy. Um, there's no right or wrong other than our goal was the same. And the question is, how do you get there? Yeah, the only thing I'd add, because I think Sue covered it really well, is, uh, you know, the RTOs uh, have a tremendous role in this. But frankly, again, what the individual states do, what their individual energy companies put onto the grid into the interne interconnection queue matters a great deal. So right now, you know, there's concerns, um, you know, as MISO sort of looks forward, um, given the spiking price of natural gas for a whole bunch of reasons, including a, you know, very large geopolitical mess that is impacting energy prices, you know, there is concern about, you know, how we, we maintain reliability and capacity. Well, one thing that those folks, I hope, are considering, and they're very good over at MISO, is, is looking at how more renewable energy projects can be pushed faster through the interconnection queue. That's a really big thing that the RTO can do that's going to be helpful. But that also means there have to be state policies and companies on the ground in those states putting those sorts of things into the queue. So the only way we are going to solve for climate change is going to be consortiums of states and the federal government itself acting. So we absolutely care about it. And I think Senator Rezin's point about just the, the competitiveness economically of businesses, that marginal cost, how it changes when your competitors are doing business across state lines really does matter. So I think the hope is everyone's seeing the tipping point is coming. More renewable energy is coming. It is actually cheaper per kilowatt hour um, than natural gas and coal in many cases, has been since before CEGA passed. This is the wave of the future. And hopefully, again, to Senator Resin's point, we've sort of lit the way in terms of the just transition and involving organized labor and involving communities of color. And maybe others can jump on board in a way that brings everybody's prices down and everybody's carbon emissions down. And just to add a labor perspective sure. to your question, one of the principles mm -hmm. that we, you know, developed and then tried our best to adhere to through the negotiations process, because it really came down to the decarbonization discussion. That's sure. kind of was the sticking point for the last four plus months of the bill, was that we didn't want to be shutting down fossil generation in Illinois and then importing fossil generation because of, you know, shortage of, of right. capacity into Illinois. And there were a lot of negotiations around, uh, and the deputy governor did a good job describing it, about safeguards, making sure we're doing this in an orderly, rational manner, but putting in safeguards to make sure if, in fact, we're not able to meet the, the, the capacity demands that the customers have in the state as a way to look at that and to perhaps rethink about how we're scheduling the, the decarbonization piece of it. Before we open it up to questions, Delmar, I have one question for you. Was yeah. there anything, obviously, um, there is a, victory for having the legislation passed, but was there anything in there that, or was there anything that was sort of missed opportunities in the legislation that you would have see, liked to have seen in there or perhaps revisited uh, at a future day to implement? I, I think there's always things that you can do better in any process, but as Senator Rezin said, um, there were many nights that I think all of us left and we weren't sure if we were gonna get this passed um, for a variety of reasons. And so I think the overwhelming emotion I had was thankfulness that we were all able to work together to get to something um, that, as Senator Rezin said, is nation-leading legislation. Um, I think the thing that I'm probably thinking about, because I'm kind of in the here and now with this bill, is implementation. And it's going to be really important as this bill moves forward that we don't let our old systems, old mindsets, and old processes uh, put us in a position where underserved communities get left behind, where the jobs that we've set aside uh, resources to help support don't come to fruition. Um, and we have great leaders at our state agencies, and so um, part of what I want to do is to support them as they move forward and implement this but also to hold all of us accountable that we meet the goals and the targets that we've laid out and that we do it in an inclusive way. So no regrets, but also just fair warning that all of us need to stay engaged, all of us need to stay involved, and we really need to work together as a team to get this bill implemented in a way that we all can be proud of. Well, let's get to some questions. Uh, anybody have a question? Yes. 
Hi, I'm going to be reading a question from someone on YouTube. Okay. So Ellen Partridge says, um, well, firstly, she says, great that training programs are included. What training is provided for auto mechanics to move from fossil fuel cars to electric cars? I'll, t I'll take a stab at that. Um, the, the question, I believe, was what tr types of training is involved with auto mechanics to transition from combustible engine to uh, EV? So our United Auto Workers, which is one of our affiliates under the Illinois AFL-CIO umbrella, um, definitely very interested in organizing electric vehicle manufacturers in Illinois. We have a plant in Rivian um, that's currently producing trucks in Bloomington named Rivian. And then there's discussions about transitioning perhaps some of the existing manufacturing that they do in the state to EVs. There's also the bus company. Line Electric. In, Line Electric in the oh, yeah. southwest suburbs. Our, our affiliates have training programs and work with the manufacturers and work with the, the, the dealers to provide the type of training that would allow workers to transition. I don't personally have a depth of knowledge as to what's included in it, but I do know there are opportunities out there for mechanics to make that transition. The one thing I'll add to that, uh, Pat referenced earlier uh, the Reimagining Electric Vehicles Act that we passed in the veto session, I want to say, last year. Uh, it includes credits, again, to Pat's point about the supply chain for electric vehicles as well as the manufacturers themselves, but also a credit for job training provided by employers mm -hmm. and by labor unions on site. So that's one way we're going to be incentivizing that training that UAW and others come up with. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Emily. I'm a first year grad student studying public policy, specifically environmental policy. Um, and I wanted to ask a question related to federal climate bills and kind of if this is something that obviously this has national attention, climate policy isn't something that is that each state is just handling on their own. There's a potential for more federal policy. Is there some, how do you think about um, future funds feeding into these programs, these initiatives? Is that something that you can use to either implement faster, like actions from the climate bill, or is that something that would have to be an entirely separate initiative? Or how, how would you think about that as a, a, a potential down the road? I'll take a stab at folks don't mind. So uh, it's a really good question. Uh, let me give you a concrete example, actually, from EJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. So that is going through, through formula funds, going to provide $150 million to the state of Illinois for electric vehicle charging through our Department of Transportation. What that means is we now take the 70 million or so that we already had through Rebuild Illinois that we repurposed through this bill, we layer those two things on top of each other and we've effectively like tripled our throw weight uh, in terms of electric vehicle charging. Now the feds want to focus on main thoroughfares, state high, interstate highways. So now we know that that sort of like, you know, access is covered. Well now we can maybe focus those funds and the EPA is going through this process now on thinking about how do we get to some of the more equity eligible areas that are not as easy to commercialize? So in some ways it can be symbiotic, for example. There's other things I would say, when we, they, things passed down through the Workforce Investment Act um, that will help, I think, elevate the training that we've discussed, mm -hmm. both through the climate hubs as well as through the climate, the, I'm mixing them up. I'm gonna say the community hubs <laughs> and the union hubs, to just keep it clean. Um, that stuff will help, for example, uh, and then finally, I think there's some other emerging technology that will help decarbonize, harder to, to, to decarbonize sectors. Hydrogen is one of those. There's $8 billion in coming down from hydrogen hubs. Uh, we started a conversation near the end of session about how Illinois, along with Midwest partners, could take advantage of that. The Build Back Better Act contemplated a $3 per kilogram tax credit uh, for green hydrogen, because that's about the gap between renewable energy produced hydrogen and hydrogen produced through fossil fuels. That will be key to both what Senator Rezin and as well as Pat talked about relative to um, some of those combined cycle plants being able to shift to green hydrogen. So there's a bunch of different ways that if the feds do this right, and from our conversations with DOE and the White House, they intend to, that will enhance states like Illinois and, and will say, you guys have taken the first step, let's increase your competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. All right. Did that answer your question? Hello, uh, my name is Kate and I'm a first year in the college. Um, my question is uh, specific to Senator Rezin. I was wondering about two things you said that struck me. So the first one you said um, was that, um, of course, like the bill that you're talking about is a model for like other states across the country. Um, and you also mentioned that there's sort of this blinding narrative, especially among your Republican colleagues, that a bill like this 
just destroys jobs within the fossil fuel industry. So my question is more specific to the negotiating strategy, strategies you used at the table, right? How did you move past that blinding narrative? And how do you think on a more broader scale mm -hmm. we can convince more Republicans to support yeah. renewable energy policy? Well, I don't think it's a Republican or a Democrat issue. It's just by nature of the districts they represent. So the majority of my colleagues represent Southern Illinois. And if you look at their energy makeup in Southern Illinois, it's really the coal plants in Southern Illinois and MISO and, and some natural gas plants. Um, there's only one operating unit at the Quad nuclear plant that would be in the MISO. So um, I'm not sure that it's a, a blinding narrative. It, it, af it affects and impacts them directly. And um, sometimes when we get in a room and we're reading and researching and we all have our thoughts about where we should move the state in policy, but the actual practical effects uh, we leave to the person representing the area. And that's what's happening. Um, at first, when we started having these discussions, you know, the discussions were, well, we need to close the plants and we need to move here and we need to go there. And, and by some people that were in, you know, uh, hadn't been in my district. And um, I said, have you been or did you come to my district when your policy or the bill that was passed previously closed the coal plant? Regardless of what side of that conversation you're on, when a plant closes in a town, you have hundreds of people show up. And they want to know what they're going to do next. That the value of that conversation with me and with my colleagues from Southern Illinois has helped in this bill because we do have a component in the bill that makes that transition easier and um, educates people and makes sure, uh, along with Pat's help, that we bring them to the next step. I'm not sure that it was in place when we passed FIJA in 2016. But I mean, it's, you know, at the end of the day, people just want to put food on their table. Right? We're having a high-level policy conversation here at University of Chicago. The people I represent are worrying about how they're going to put food on the table and have enough money to put their kids in college. And when you're talking about closing plants, that's a real issue. So it is a challenge. It's education. And it's just not something you can educate overnight. We've talked about this for two years. I've sat on hundreds of working groups along with my colleagues. But not all my colleagues are sitting in the working group, so then I have to go back and educate them when we're in our caucus to explain why it's good for them or why it's not. And some of them, too, the largest uh, employer, Peoria, Caterpillar's there. I mean, what we're talking about, even though they may agree with, but their bottom line is this is going to increase the cost, and they're, they're a high energy user. So they are concerned about how much in this is going to increase their cost while they're um, weighing the, you know, of course we want to decrease the climate, but we can't, we have to be cognizant of increasing costs as well. Hi, I'm Eric, uh, I'm a fourth year in the college. Thanks for the panel discussion, it was really enlightening. Um, I guess like, I, I think all the efforts in like reallocating and like transitioning, like the distribution of energy and how we produce it is like super helpful. And I, I guess I also wonder like, where does like people come in play with that? Because I think like, like just like you said with with jobs, like when a plant closes, like um, should there be incentives to help people like re relocate, or should there be incentives for like private companies to relocate now to, to underserved communities and communities where where plants have closed? Yeah, I think I'm going to take the first stab at it, and I think the deputy governor might have something to add as well. So there is a just transition piece in the legislation. Um, and frankly, of all the great things that are in the bill, this is one that could probably use to be beefed up a little bit or some improvements given the devastating nature of what happens to a region when a coal generation facility shuts down. And these are in places oftentimes where there's not a lot of other good jobs, good paying jobs in, in the regions of, of the state. Um, some of the just transition pieces that we came up with in our original proposals uh, ended up on the cutting room floor. I mean, there were things around health insurance payments and wage replacements. But again, in this bill, there's a lot of investing in both the labor force as well as the equity provisions. So there was only so much the market would bear around just transition. But to be fair, in the bill, 
Um, there's educational opportunities and scholarships for children of displaced energy workers. Um, there's assistance and, and retraining. I mean, these workforce development hubs are going to be instrumental in helping some of these employees that wish to make a transition into renewable energy development or other types of building and construction trade fields. Um, so there are things that assist these communities. I just think we probably need to go a little bit further and help in, in terms of future considerations as to what we might do to assist. Yeah, I'd say I'd only add two things. I think Pat covered it very well. I'd say one um, to the earlier question relative to what the federal government can do, this is a place where they could be helpful, mm -hmm. is to come in through their Department of Labor, through the Department of Energy, and say, whatever we pass, we're going to make sure these tax incentives are targeted toward uh, maybe an additional incentive, for example, locating in one of these communities. We did that in the Reimagining Electric Vehicles Act. If you locate in one of these energy transition areas, you get additional incentive. And that was a push from our office, but also a push from Pat and the AFL-CIO. So those sorts of things where, as we look at state policy going forward, we say we want to make sure that we address environmental justice. We want to make sure that we address a just transition. If we keep that lens on everything, I think we can get to some of what you're talking about, Eric. And I just wanted to add just really quickly that process is also important in this. Um, one of the things that the Clean Jobs Coalition did was to have a member of our negotiating team that was focused on the community. And I can't express enough that I don't think the policies that we had in this bill would have occurred the way they would have had we not had the community's voice involved in the process. So as you're thinking about policy, I think it's good to have kind of a, a, a high-level policy framework in place, but I can't stress enough the importance of inclusivity and including voices from those that will be most impacted by the bill at the table to discuss and negotiate the provision. Well, we do have time for a couple more questions. Let's just try to get to them. <laughs> Hi, my name is Connor Lee. I'm a second-year student at UChicago. My question is, how can young people and people who aren't in government positions best contribute to these efforts to combat climate change, specifically in the state of Illinois? I, nope. I would just say that you're seeing it already. I mean, that's for you, it's a given. I believe for your generation, it's a given. You want to, you recognize the climate's changing. You do want to see policies that are reflective of it. And it's just up to us to figure out what that policy looks like to make sure that it's you know, as we're changing that all of the different things that we've talked about today, um, we're keeping in mind as well. But I, I see it now with your generation and I think the acceptance and if you look at the larger, um, very large uh, companies, their goals are they'll only buy renewable energy. Their goal is, you know, only having their energy portfolio that is, uh, um, that's, um, that they're using to be zero carbon. So you're seeing it with the large companies now and you're gonna see the push down to the moderate companies, especially as the price comes down for the renewables that uh, Chris, uh, Deputy Governor Christian Michels talked about. So it will be a little bit easier for the mid-sized companies to, to handle and then ultimately the smaller, but we're seeing it because of your generation in my opinion. I'll try to keep it brief. I'll say a couple things. First of all, I'm an alum of the university. I'm class of 08. Uh, I lived in Albert House down the street uh, mm -hmm. when it was new, which is wild to say. Um, but uh, one, anything that I can do, you know, for any of you, the university knows how to find me. So if you're interested in interning or anything like that, let us know. And, and not just with us, Environmental Council, there's an NRDC chapter here, like they do great work. The thing I would say is learn about politics, not just policy. Um, the thing that was sort of shocking for me when I came out of school as public policy student here undergrad was I thought the issue was the right report wasn't on the right shelf, wasn't in the right hands, the right idea wasn't there. And that's actually very seldom true. It is sometimes true, but it's pretty seldom true. It is, what are the politics? Have you spent enough time talking to people like Senator Resin and the people in her area to understand where they're coming from? You may not totally agree with it, but it is valid. It is valid and it needs to be heard. It is spending time, you know, and we haven't talked about him tonight, but with um, our mutual friend Terry McGoldrick with IBW Local 15, who every single time he came to talk to me was like, I hear you about the policy. I gotta go sit in front of a shop of a thousand people and I gotta tell them whether they're gonna have a job tomorrow. You gotta understand what that means. What does it mean to balance equity? What does it mean to balance labor? What does it mean to balance mm -hmm. uh, downstate coal plants mm -hmm. versus you know, the, the <laughs> North Siders who want it to be all renewable and think even nuclear should go away? You gotta learn about self-interest and how that works if you wanna be effective at changing the world. And you have to be able to count to 51%. 
because if you got the 51%, any bill passes, and you have to form your coalition. And it's not a top-down approach, like in business, top-down where the, the CEO is making the decision and everybody else, all the managers follow. We're in the world of building coalitions, right? And you, right here, this is a coalition. When I talked about, I mean, I don't always work with my colleagues on different issues, but on this issue, we were front and center for two years together, um, a team. And that got us enough votes to get to 51% to get a very, very major shift in policy change. But it took, I mean, we were at the Capitol for, I don't even know, uh, 14, 16 hours every day, creating that relationship, understanding the politics, as Christian said, is your, your number one issue. Because here, what I find interesting is you think it sounds like, oh, this is simple. Every, of course we want to save our planet. And of course, we need to get to 0% carbon footprint in the year 2050. But when you figure out what that looks like and how do we get there, that's when all of this comes into play and it's very difficult. Well, unfortunately, we are going to have to leave it there. We ran out of time, but our panelists will be here after the program to answer whatever questions you have. And I'd like to thank all our guests today, Pat Delvaney, Secretary Treasurer of the Illinois AFL-CIO, Damar Gillis, CEO of Elevate Energy, Christian Mitchell, Deputy Governor of Illinois, and Illinois State Senator Sue Resin. Thank you all so much thank for this, you. and thank you to the University of Chicago job, Institute friend. of Politics. I'm Michael.